colorful conifers. Um, before we get started, I, I really struggled with creating this program because I, I really didn't want to give out a plant grocery list. I, I don't want you to think that you're just going to go out and find all of these plants. Um, no, some, some are uh, plants that you might have to go online. You might find some at your garden centers or nurseries, but uh, having been a collector now for going on, oh, easily 17 years, you know, to me, sometimes the, the hunt and the discovery is is part of the fun of this and learning about these plants. So as I as you go through this, realize what I'm trying to do is give you an overall idea of what's out there. Because I'm going to be showing you examples of pine, spruce, arborvitae, hemlock, camisiparis, fir. I'm going to be throwing in some uh, for southern Illinois, some of the, the, the cypress. Uh, and if you just get an idea of what you're looking for, you might find something very similar, though it might not be that exact cultivar, but it could be something very similar. So with that, we're going to start talking about these things called conifers. And the one thing when people think about with conifers, here's a couple, you know, typical front landscapes. Um, the one on your left, I mean, it, it's nicely um, uh, balanced. It looks good against the house. Um, I would have really liked to have seen a little bit more color and a little bit more visual interest, but overall, it's, it's a nice landscape. The one on the right, it's um, very minimalistic, and uh, we see a lot of, of this. So we're kind of going from looking at an extreme of a front landscape and to another that um, really could use some, some greening up. But as I talk about these plants, the one thing when I mentioned conifers is that people always say they're so green. Well, yeah, they, they are. Green is the most common color that we have in our landscape. I consider green to be the, the, you know, like the white of the fashion world or the white of the paint world because it really goes with ever, everything. It's great as a background. It's great to build off of with other um, plants. But even with that word green, we have the yellow greens. We have the blue greens and then we get into the deep 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 almost purple black greens so even in that you know simple word of green you have quite a variety now conifers i'm showing you here um, a, a landscape with i'm assuming some arborvitaes and possibly some yews uh, it's it's going to give you that privacy and that color and that backdrop year round. But I want you to start thing, thinking about what could we add to still have visual interest throughout the seasons? And that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about conifers with color. Now, conifers are also, when I mention them, people say, oh, they just get so big. And I know we've, we've seen houses like this. In fact, it might be our house. Uh, and I know, I know there's a front door behind there, and I know there's some windows. But those plants are doing what those plants were designed to, to, to do. So today, what I'm going to introduce you to is the different sizes that the American Conifer Society um, categorizes a lot of the, the conifers. Um, because yes, when we see this, you know, we've, we know we've probably lost those people uh, having an interest in getting more of these. Now, this is a beautiful stone farmhouse that I pass twice a day on my way to and from work. And it's, it's a lovely stone building. And those yews are just engulfing it. And I always just want to go and part those bushes and see what the front door looks like and see what the windows look like. Because yes, when you're not doing your research, you're not understanding the plant, 
they can easily cover your house. And then what do people do with those plants? Well, I call it meatball pruning. And they're taking those plants and they're cutting them to a size that the homeowner finds manageable rather than doing the research and working with the plant to fit and work in your space. So today what we're going to talk about is that there's that there are conifers that grow very slowly and they come in a wide range of colors. So I'd like to welcome you to the world of colorful conifers. Colorful conifers can brighten any landscape. Uh, you combine the, the colors you're seeing here, yellows and blues and reds and golds and a little bit of whites. Um, just adding some of our deciduous plant material, maybe an interesting Japanese maple or, or a dogwood, or you might have plants that have berries. You might have some hollies or um, bayberries. Or as you go into the winter season and you have the colorful conifers, you might have some cones. You might have remnants of some old cones. So there's a whole world out there. Now, some, some conifers, yeah, they're kind of plain Jane during the summer, but then they transition into a beautiful color come wintertime. And we call those transitional conifers, and I'll talk about some of those. When the cold temperatures arrive, the colors just pop. So if you look here, you're seeing colors of um, all, all shades, you're seeing all sizes. Now let's talk a little bit about growing these plants. Now, many of the conifers are related to the tall evergreens that are growing in our forests. So the majority are reaching for the sun. They want the sun. So the majority of these are going to be plants that are going to be ne needed to be planted in a sunny location. But there's also those plants that grow under that forest canopy and we have the understory trees. So we do have some that can tolerate some shade. There's not a lot that can tolerate dense shade, but as you go through the program, I'll try to share with you which ones can tolerate some light shade. Uh, the other things um, we have to talk about cold zones majority of the ones I'm talking about today are tolerant of zones um, six, five, four, some going up into three, some going all the way up north into two. There are some that will tolerate zone seven. I'll share those with you. Uh, we can't grow those up here. So there's, there's definitely plants that only are going to grow um, in southern Illinois and places south, but then there's definitely those that will grow central Illinois all the way up to the Canadian border. The other thing people always ask is about the soil. What type of soil do they need? Well, just like with any other landscape plant, we want them to have um, a loose, uh, well-drained uh, media. Now, some of these don't really like a rich soil because where we're finding them is growing up in the, um, you know, the Rockies where it is. It's the soil is gritty and there's not a lot of organic matter. So you might find in your heavy Midwest soils, some of these plants just aren't going to do well for you. Uh, I, I personally in my garden, I've given up on hemlocks. I just cannot grow hemlocks. I really feel it's my soil. I have a very rich, rich, heavy soil. I also think it has to do with my soil pH. I think it's um, alkaline. Now you go visit a friend maybe 10 miles away and their hemlocks are beautiful, but they might be on a grittier soil or maybe more of a slightly acidic soil. On the flip side, I can grow Japanese white pines, which is Pinus parviflora, and my friends that have tried them, their soils don't work. So it, it, sometimes it's a little bit of um, trial and error with these, but the, the, the rewards are so great. So first, I wanna talk about using color in the landscape. 
you know, the human eye sees color in a nanosecond. It's, it registers it without us being conscious about it. And just a little bit about using colors in the landscape. Warm colors, your oranges, your yellows, your reds, they want to come toward us and they can be seen from a distance. Now our cool colors, those are going to be primarily in the conifers, it's going to be the blues and it's going to be uh, maybe some with some red purple tinges and when we start to get into the really really deep deep green blacks, these cool colors want to recede. So they want to go away from us and we don't see them at a distance. So you hear the term, we lose the blues. So if you're thinking about your landscape and you're thinking about, okay, it's awfully green, think about the distance you're viewing and think about when we start using these colors, how to use them in contrast. So here I drew out this diagram. Here we have a variety of shapes, a variety of sizes, textures, but everything is that same green. So the visual interest is not with the color, the visual interest is more with the shape and structure of the plant material. Now we bring in some different shades of green. It's starting to get more visually interesting because now we're starting to get some depth to the landscape. We're starting to see contrast between the darker shades and lighter shades of green. Let's think about adding some of the other colors. Here I've just thrown in some blues and some purples and you know they're not, they don't pop, they don't pop you know, as vivid as some of the lighter colors. And actually, from a distance, that purple in the center can actually look like a, a dark hole in your landscape um, if it's just there by itself. And, you know, your eye is going to stop there. It's not going to pull through. So what can we do if we want to use some of these colors? Well, go back to our different shades of green, visually interesting. But now let's add some yellows and some limey greens. Now everything starts to pop. The whole feel of that garden is, is lighter. Um, it just gives a, a whole dimension. And hopefully as you're looking at this, your eye is being drawn through. It's like connecting the dots. Those yellows are, are just pulling your eye through. You might not realize it at the time, but that's what's happening. So now you've got different shades of greens. You've got some different shades of golds and yellows and limes. Let's bring in some of those purples and blues. And you can see now that those colors stand out more. This garden overall is more visually interesting with these colors than what we had in the very beginning with just the solid shade of green. So think about how you're going to place these in your landscape. So you want to use color to pull the eye and it's going to pull the landscape together. This is my east border and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to pull the viewer's eye through and I'm trying to do it with yellow. So here I'm starting off with the, um, well this I have a, um, I'm trying to get a pen going, right here is a um, variegated iris, here is a low growing yellow juniper, this right here is a yellow blooming sedum, this right here is a golden tradescantia, and this right here is a tree peony that's in bloom at that time. So hopefully your eye has been drawn through. Now you connect the dots. What if I suddenly put a dark purple right there? Well, your eye stops, and that's, that's what I mean by creating a hole in the landscape. It stops. It's like a sink where nothing's going to move beyond it. So when you're using colors for that, 
if I had chosen to put maybe a bar berry in there or something, I definitely would have had would have contrasted it up against something in the background. And here it's just a high noon tree peony in the back that's blue and gold tradescantia. I have sedum acre and then mother load juniper. And I didn't put, that's just iris pallida. It's one of the variegated iris. So when you are going to the, the nursery and you're looking, if I'm finding a variety of plant material, and I do this not only with evergreens, but I'll start to actually think about staging and, and how I'm going to use them. The one on the left, this was a garden that I toured in Ohio with the Perennial Plant Association. And this, uh, these gardeners would sink the pots. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's a rim of a pot right there. And they would leave them in their pots and kind of move them around before they found a spot where they thought, okay, that's where I want to put it. They didn't want to disturb the roots and then have to transplant it. Um, and I've done this now. I've, I've done it where I've sunk a pot and just, how is it going to do there? How's the sunlight going? And then if I like where it is, then I'll put it there. If not, then I'm going to think about, let's, let's lift it out of the ground and let's see if there's another spot. So I'm, I'm just kind of moving them around till I find that perfect spot. On the right, this was just at a garden center with a variety of colors. Now, there's some tall in the back, rounded in the front. Uh, just showing you the variety of, of some purples and yellows and different shades of blue. This was at a American Conifer Society um, meeting we had in Michigan. These were people's homes that were open for tours. Um, on the right, you see the um, uh, blue spruce intermixed with a golden camisiparis. Uh, just a nice combination. And on the left, I don't have the tag, but I think that's going to be AB's Normandica Golden Spreader and a blue spruce behind it. Just using those color combinations to really make those colors pop. But first we have to talk a little bit about genetics, a little bit about variability and um, where these, these plants come from. Now here I'm showing you blue spruce. These are all seedling blue spruce. Seedlings, if the plants have been open pollinated, their genetics are not going to be identical and we start to get um, different attributes. Here we're definitely seeing a bluer blue spruce up against another blue spruce that's more of a gray green. The one in the back has, is really coming up more of an upright uh, shape to it. So when you're growing from seed and the genetics, you're not sure what's going to be dominant, this is what you can get. So what plant people do, plant, when they go out on plant hunts, uh, they're looking for conifers that have something different about their growth. Uh, they're looking for what we call witches brooms. These are congested growth that just form like a gnarly bunch of, 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 of branches. Usually they're going to be round. They could be, you know, a flat shaped because there's something that we really don't know what causes these witches brooms. We, some people suspect that it's insects injecting a virus. Some people suspect that it might be more environmental. Some people suspect that it's just a genetic mishap that went on in that plant resulting in this growth. So what they'll do is they'll take up some of that growth and they'll try to grow it on, usually on a graft. So they might find this witch's broom in the middle of nowhere, they're growing it on. They really don't know until they've had that plant for several years, what it's going to grow into. The other thing is you might hear the term sport or spontaneous mutation. This is usually where it's a change of color. And perhaps you've had a plant in your landscape where one season for who knows what reason, it shoots out a yellow foliaged uh, limb. 
Okay, so that that's a sport. Now, someone would see that and say, wow, that's a, that's kind of neat. I want to be able to grow that. So how can I propagate it? How can I get more of this? So they would take a piece of that. They might try to root it or they might go to grafting. So when you look at these plants, and there's several I'm going to share with you today, we might not know what they're exactly going to do just yet. Uh, the American Conifer Society has a phenomenal database, and it's built by its members who, who get these plants, grow them on, and then go onto the website as a member, put up a picture, and then we start to learn what other people are doing, doing with this plant and how it is growing. Also, because of this, there's more time involved. So people often are surprised that some of these plants can be very expensive, but you might be looking at 20 years of growth. So, you know, take all of that into consideration when you're looking into um, conifers. So this was my very first, our very first one. This is St. Mary's broom. It's a Picea pungens. It's a blue spruce. Uh, it's a graft. It was from a witch's broom. And I, it's been in the trade a long time. I think this has been there almost 17 years. Um, it's maybe three feet tall by three and a half feet wide. So after 17 years, that's not bad. Now, the American Conifer Society, ACS, I was very surprised, did not have this in their uh, database. So now I'm thinking I should take my picture, I should go on, and I should start the conversation because I know there's a lot of people that have this because this is a fairly common um, broom that's been in the trade for a long time. So this is Picea pungent um, St. Mary's broom. This is Picea pungens blue pearl. Now, blue pearl is what we call a miniature, and I'm going to share the size chart with you um, in the next slide, where a miniature only puts out less than an inch um, a year. So you get this tight, tight, tight uh, growth to it, and you just get very little new growth every year, but it stays in this tight uh, little bun shape. It was a witch's broom, actually found on a fat Albert uh, blue spruce, um, and they're saying in 10 years it'll be six inches tall and maybe about 12 inches wide. Um, this also, if you notice up at the top, I have it listed as a 219 ACS. The American Conifer Society has put out its program to um, introduce people to the world of conifers, and it's the Collector of the Year, the Conifer of the Year series. So in 2019, this was offered to the membership for sale. Now, they've been doing this for, since 2006. Uh, the first, well, three or four years, they would only offer two two different types. Well, in 2019, they offered seven, and in 2020, they offered nine different types of dwarf unusual conifers for membership to purchase. I think that's a great place for you to start. If you're new to this, you can go on their website, click on the Collector Conifer of the Year series. You can print out the, um, I think it's about six pages and it'll list every single one that they have recommended to the membership and you can learn a little bit out, uh, about them click on the uh, name and it'll send you to a picture so when we talk about size we're not we're not really going for ultimate size yes that's important but the American Conifer Society really concentrates more on growth per year. So that miniature one we just saw, Blue Pearl, that on average grows less than an inch a year. So that's tiny, that's miniature. Now, if a plant on average puts out an inch to six inches a year, we call it a dwarf six to 12 inches a year, it's intermediate, and anything over 12 inches is going to be large. 
Now, I also should preface this and say, once the plant is established, because you might not get this growth while the plant is, is getting itself established. So yes, ultimate size is important, but when I say miniature, I'm really saying that plant only puts out less than an inch. So in 20 years, it could be two feet. Okay, so just, just keep that in mind. Everyone thinks it's ultimate size, but it's not. So here's an abies. This is a fir. I've, I, I've shared with you some spruce already. Um, this is blue cloak, and it is listed as an intermediate, which means once established, 6 to 12 inches a year. This is a beautiful uh, semi-pendulous fir with these soft, bright, blue needles. It forms an upright leader and then the, the branches kind of weep. They, they don't weep, they just kind of drop, droop a little bit. So you have this very soft, soft texture. Full sun, uh, well-drained soil. This was, it's growing out in um, a nursery in Oregon and they um, really aren't sure of where it it started, but they think it was selected from a group of seedlings showing blue color. So that was Abies Con Color Large. Here we have Abies Con Color Miniature. Okay, here, this is called Piggle Me, and it was found on a witch's broom, so it was that, that gnarled, contorted growth, and they took pieces of that and grafted it onto an appropriate root stock. Uh, it's only going to put out, you know, like a, less than an inch a year. It's going to have that cushion or bunge shaped. It can be uh, grown in a rock garden or other small spaces. This is a picture from um, friends of mine um, that live in um, Iowa, uh, Tom and Gary Wittenbaugh. They don't have a big yard. So what they really seek out are plants that they they hope are going to be in this miniature to dwarf uh, category so that they can stay small and stay in spot in place. These are another type of fur. This is Abies laziocarpa. Here, um, Abies laziocarpa alpine fur. Um, the uh, one that I show you on the right is variety uh, Arizonica, slow growing, densely pyramidal. Uh, these uh, plants get their name from alpine fir because they're found above the tundra uh, zone, way above the timber line. Th these guys are tough. These guys are tough. But here you see an intermediate, but then on the other side, you see this short little guy called prickly peat. Same blue needles, same, you know, blue coloration, but its growth, be it a genetic mishap, be it some type of virus, this is the growth that it's going to um, maintain. Now, on both of these, ACS didn't have that much information on them, but I know the Arizonica is in the trade. There's also uh, Arizonica compacta, which is in the trade. Here's another fur. This is Glauca prostrata, and this is the prostrate noble fur, and it's a beautiful spreading blue uh, evergreen, silvery blue foliage. It's really considered an evergreen um, ground cover, and in 10 years, they anticipate the height only to be about two feet tall, but uh, about six feet wide. This uh, being an abies again can tolerate going up into easily into zones three uh, and um, two. It likes well-drained soils. It sometimes sometimes these new plants aren't what we call stable. So if you were to get this in one season, it just started to send out a really strange-looking leader and growth. Um, I would recommend cutting that out because sometimes these aren't stable. We're still we're we're still learning about them, but this one I've seen and I actually have it on order for my garden <laughs> this spring. I just love the color. It was a branch sport is where this one came from. 
Okay, camiciparis. I'm showing you yet another type of, of conifer. Camiciparis, um, usually the blues, uh, you're going to have a softer juvenile foliage that becomes uh, tinted uh, when it gets cold. There's one called Boulevard that's been in the trade. It's taller. That one usually gets about three, four, four and a half feet. Uh, but now they're finding um, a lot of these uh, ones that are staying much smaller and again this is from my friend Gary and the ACS we just don't have a size for it yet. This is a Pinus parviflora. This is the Japanese white pine, very nice white pine. This one's called Blue Lou and Blue Lou is only going to looks to me when I look at the growth, maybe put out a couple inches a year so I guess I would think of the dwarf but again as this grows, people need to go online and um, report it, talk about it. Now, Pinus parviflora is also popular if you're into bonsai. Yeah. So, if you're if you're into bonsai, these plants uh, they they're not known for their speed. They're slow growing, and as a bonsai expert, um, you know they can be uh, manipulated. Now, when we get into the nomenclature. This plant, because of its long tradition with, with bonsai and being used, it has been grafted on numerous understocks. And not all understocks will react the same with the upper portion. And so they're finding a lot of vari variability, but they're also finding it very interesting. Okay, this is um, Phelan Blue Himalayan Cedar. Now, for those of you that are dialing in from the southern part of the state, this is one that you can grow. We can't grow it. I wish we could. It is, uh, it's going to only get about three feet tall, but it's going to spread out. It definitely has this, this soft, beautiful, blue texture, color and texture to it. And what they have planted behind it is um, an arborvitae, a golden arborvitae called sunlight. Uh, so this would be definitely one to have in a Southern Illinois garden, even getting down into to Kentucky. For those of us up here, if we wanted to grow this, uh, it would have to be in a container and we would have to bring it in to overwinter it. Some more blues. So you can see blue is a very popular, not pop, easy color to obtain in the conifer world because I've shown you pine and chemiciparis and fir and spruce. Um, and now I'm showing you junipers. There's a lot of blue star junipers out there. Our, our squamata, this one's blue star. And you probably have seen this. This has been in the trade for a long time. It's very commonly seen in nurseries and it's probably one of the uh, most popular of the low growing junipers. This plant uh, has a nice steel blue foliage. Um, it's a dwarf, so maybe two to four inches a year. Um, that's me standing in, in front uh, on my property. And right here, I'll try to highlight it. I have a, a whole row of the uh, blue star junipers. Now this picture is probably about, oh, seven years old. And those blue stars now have mounted up to, oh, maybe about 20, 24 inches and just stand out, especially this time of year. They'll also, as it gets colder, take on a plum look, a plum color to them. This was a witch's broom that they found. It was actually, um, found in the Netherlands and they were able to graft it and introduce it into the trade. So that's just a sampling of the blue and this this talk is in no way all inclusive because there's just so many out there. Now we're going to switch into gold and gold is another color that we find in in our landscapes and there's lots of plants that can offer us gold. This is Picea abies gold drift. This was um, a collector plant in 2013 and you can see it's it's got a weeping shape it sometimes it, you know will kick out 
strange arms, so no two will look the same. But at this particular conifer meeting, we were all given three flags. I think we were at three. And we had to go around. We were at Hidden Lakes um, Gardens in Michigan, beautiful conifer gardens. And we were asked to put flags uh, next to the plants that we really liked. And so you can see here that there are quite a few people that really like this Picea abies gold drift. Gold conifers, they're just going to add a burst of bright color. And especially this time of year, um, when our garden is, is drab, they, they just kind of want to jump out at us. Now, yellow, the, the, the yellow uh, tissue is photosynthetic. It, it can create its own food, but oftentimes with our yellow conifers, they do a little better if we can give them some shade, particularly um, late afternoon shade and if you can try to avoid um, winter sun because uh, that can really do, uh, burn out some of the light colored uh, foliage. Um, we think of yellows and golds, we usually only think of it as an autumn color because that's when we start to see it in our in our woody plant material. But there's a lot of, of yellows and golds that we can add to our landscape year round. Um, like I said, if you if you have a spot protected from um, afternoon shade and especially winter uh, sun, you might want to try one of these. Now, I've talked with a lot of conifer people and what they feel is that sometimes your younger conifers go through like the teenage years and you have to give them a little bit of protection um, for the first couple of years. And I have found with some of my gold yellow conifers especially in the winter I just put a shade barrier up and I do this for maybe two seasons and then they're fine. So here what I'm showing you this is my backyard this picture I took in late December just late December 2019. So you can see shapes sizes um, I'm sure you're noticing um, this little guy right here a yellow popping out and then I've got a yellow up here. Um, both of those are winter accent but you're thinking oh that's kind of dark that really doesn't look like much but this was one of those gray December days and here I went out in January same spot same everything blue sky and that's really when those colors popped and we'll talk about each of these. Um, the one over here this is Chief Joseph and then we're going to talk, the next slide is we're going to talk about this camiciparis. But I show you this because even when the days are kind of dreary, they're going to pop. But boy, when we get a nice blue sky day, or I like it when we have that fresh blanket of snow and the sun comes out the next day, those colors on those conifers really pop. So this is uh, Camiciparis pisifera golden mop. This is on top of my pond. Um, it's considered a dwarf that has been there probably 12 years. And I guess it's maybe four and a half, five feet tall. And it has this lovely cascading. Um, and it, you just saw it in the winter time. So it looks just as nice in the winter time. Here we have another Camiciparis. This is obtusa butterball. This is a miniature. Uh, again, it's only going to put out uh, less than an inch. It's a, a dwarf globo selection of Hinoki cypress. It's very um, hardy. It does not seem to be bothered at all by sun scald. So it, it's very um, versatile in the landscape. The one on the right is uh, planted uh, the one on the left is grafted onto a standard, so it's a, some people, you know, call it a evergreen on a stick. So you can get them grafted or you can get them on, on their own roots, just if you want something a little bit taller or if you want something that's going to stay that um, small bun shape. Now, this one here in the States, we call it butterball. Um, if you're looking at catalogs, um, the Royal Horticultural Society lists this, this one is button ball. So I think over the years, you know, translations, plants coming across from Europe, plants coming over there from here, sometimes the names just get a little bit off, but butterball, button ball are the same plants. 
So some of the arborvitaes. Uh, here we have a thuya. This is Forever Goldie. It's a western red cedar, zones four through seven, uh, and we're still waiting on its size. Uh, there's a lot of golden arborvitaes. I'm just showing you two here that I found very interesting. Uh, I'm showing you two that are small. You can get them in a round globe up to about three, three and a half feet. You can get them in an upright conical, gold tipped. So just don't think the pictures I'm showing you are the only ones that are out there. Just trying to let you see the colors. This is a different thuya. This is the northern white cedar. And again, it was a selection that they made. They're growing it on um, with a nice bright yellow color year round. If you've had, um, maybe some of you have purchased De Groot's Spire. It's, a, it's an upright, narrow um, arborvitae. It's, it's very popular in the trade. It has a very thin, uh, narrow footprint. That's going to be in the Thuya occidentalis group. There's also um, Schmargard. There's a few others that aren't that wide, that don't have that big, huge footprint, so they're not going to take up and encroach onto your property if you're trying to do a natural evergreen uh, backdrop. You. This is the first you that I've shown. Uh, there's many different types of taxes. This is aria. This is considered an intermediate. And this is what it looks like in the spring. The flush of growth that comes out is just brilliant lemon yellow. Just stunning. Now, as you get into the heat of the summer, uh, it, it's going to fade out. Uh, the one that was in our garden, it was beautiful lemon yellow till about the heat, heat of July, and then it just went back to a green. But being a yew, it can tolerate shade, and it can be pruned. This one can be, can be pruned just like any of the other yew that you have in your landscape. Yellow junipers. We, I showed you earlier some of the blue junipers. Here I'm showing you golden carpet. Golden carpet is a dwarf and it has this nice yellow fol foliage that does not burn in the sun. So this one you could put in the full sun and after 10 years it's only going to be about four inches tall and anywhere from four to five feet wide. Um, this was a color sport that they found off of a juniper Juniperus horizontalis that just for some reason shot out a yellow and they were able to grow it on. Mother load is another creeping, flat, low-growing uh, coniferous shrub that has this brilliant yellow color. I like how it's cascading over that wall. And in the winter on your mother loads, they're going to kind of turn a golden bronze just on the tips. It's really very pretty. Um, and again, only at about, it'll eventually for four inches tall and eight to ten feet feet wide. Full sun for both of them. They can tolerate the sun. Okay, this this is a hemlock and uh, Tsuka canadensis. This is a vermilion winter gold and it turns a bright yellow in winter. Uh, I, I like these pictures. I like how it's contrasted up against um, the yellow of the, uh, the red of the Japanese maple. Also, the other side shows it up against the blue. Some of them won't hold their yellow color all season, all summer long, but there are some now that they're um, discovering that keep a nice yellow co color all year. This plant can take um, some shade. So if you've got a spot where it would get some afternoon shade, that would do very, that would do very nicely. Abies Norman, Normania, this is golden spreader. This is um, golden spreader Nordman fir. And it's a nice bright gold selection. It's going to grow broader than tall and it really does need some partial shade. It will exhibit some good color. Uh, I have one, I have it, what I think is almost too much shade. Uh, so I'm thinking I'm going to have to um, move it. Now with this one, it will eventually mature. It'll get a terminal leader in the center and it'll, it'll mature into um, kind of a, uh, not a very tall, but 
wide plant. So if you don't want it to grow into that shape, you can just clip the terminal out at a very, you know, just as you start to notice it. Uh, if you do that, it'll stay in this bird's nest shape. Oh gosh, roughly about 18 to two feet, 18 inches to two feet tall and probably about two feet long. Here it is if you just let it go. And you can see it's growing in the understory. It has that bright golden color. And that's if you let that terminal leader grow, it's going to form these nice layers. Um, and it's going to be wider, but it, it's a very nice golden plant. We have some whites. Um, white isn't as common as your blue and your yellows. Um, this, anything white or silver is what they call very, very light colored foliage. Some people will say that it, it has no photosynthetic uh, ability whatsoever. So it, it tends not to be as, as strong as your um, tissues that can form its own food. This is again, uh, Tsuga canadensis. This is going to be your hemlock. And because of this, this whiter, tissue, um, it can tolerate more shade. Both of these can do very well in shadier spots in your garden. They do like cool, moist woodland areas. Um, both of these, Lance and Gench White, are both considered dwarf. Gench White was my second uh, dwarf conifer that I purchased, and uh, it did well. It does well in um, some shade. Also, it doesn't like to dry out during the heat. So if you have dry shade, you, you would really want to watch this one. Pinus parviflora. This is Japanese white pine. These are beautiful. They are the, the whole, the Japanese white pines, um, we have many of them in our landscape, and they are not known for their speed of growth, and they often put out um, unique coloration or unique shapes. Now this one, I, when I did the research, uh, Tanima no Yuki, I don't know if I'm pronouncing, pronouncing that right, this plant probably has been misspelled so many times, but what it means is snow of the valley pine and it gets that name because as the, when the new growth comes out it's this white pit tinged with a little bit of pink and then as the summer progresses at least the one i have it the pink fades away but i just have these this like tuft of like white whiskers on the end of each of the branches. It's dwarf, so you can anticipate one to six inch, two to six inches every um, uh, year, and it forms a cushion or a bun. This was also a collector conifer of the year. Now this is the silver lock. You might see this one in the trade. It's fairly common. Silver lock is a Korean um, uh, fir, and it has these very interesting um, uh, needles that, that lightly curve in and expose the silverly, silvery undersides. So you get this really unique texture, but since the upper portion of the needle is green, the underside is white, the plant is still able to, to uh, produce its own food fairly well. Um, it becomes more dense with age and uh, this one here, beautiful cones. The Abies coreanas um, will push out some beautiful cones. Here I'm just showing you some of them later in the season as they're maturing. Um, so you know, think beyond the foliage color and hopefully you'll be able to enjoy some, uh, some of the beautiful cones. This is another one that I put in for those of you in southern Illinois and further south. This is one that um, it's a cedar and I wish I wish I could grow this successfully. Um, it was found in British Columbia. It has this beautiful uh, uh, pendulous soft foliage and each spring it has this bright white new growth that if it's getting too much sun can burn. A uh, typical rate for most of this is going to be an intermediate so we're looking in that six inches a year. Um, it's going to be a kind of a shrub former. 
And this one was discovered in British Columbia in, in the 1960s. And it has two sister seedlings. One is called Snow Sprite and the other is called White Imp. So if you're down in zones six and seven, this would be one that you could have in a shadier part of your landscape. This is um, a dwarf spruce. This is dwarf Alberta spruce. And this one, I really like this little daisy white. It turns daisy white in the spring. That's its new growth as it comes out. And then it goes to a blue green. Um, Sometimes, depending on the season, it's going to come out more of a pale yellow, then fade to a white, and then to a light green by the end of the summer. But I like how they described it. They said this perfect little gnome hat that lights up early spring with bright, creamy flush of new needles. And it is a, it is a dwarf. It is going to be between two and two and a half feet in 10 years. Now with my Alberta spruces, I have found they do better when I give them afternoon shade. And once I uh, move them over to a spot where it gets the afternoon shade, they've, they've really been flourishing. Cause I know a lot of people have trouble with Alberta spruces in full sun. Again, another one for um, the South, the cryptomerias. Uh, this one is Nana, and it's an elbow spica. It has white foliage to it. Dwarf selection of Japanese um, cedar. It has drooping branches that have these nodding tips. Um, the new growth comes out all white or a slightly whitely variegated. It does tend to burn in full sun. Um, and it is a dwarf, so after 10 years, you know, it might be three, three and a half feet tall. Now, the one color that we don't see a lot of is red or purple or fuchsia. And oftentimes, we're only going to see this on the flush of new growth in the spring. It's the most unusual coloration for conifers. Uh, you see it on the new growth, or you're going to see it on emerging cones. Um, this one, Rubra spicata, it's a, it's a Norway um, spruce. And really, this, when the spring growth comes out, it's going to come out this nice flush of red. Then depending on weather, if we have a cool spring, it'll stay um, a flush of red longer. But if we get heat, it's going to turn uh, to somewhat of a reddish brown and then go to a green. Um, so it's, it's only a fleeting look at this color, but more and more plants are being introduced showing this. This is a um, blue spruce. This is ruby teardrops. Uh, it's among uh, one of the bluest of the Colorado spruce, but the color is even more spectacular when you have these ruby red cones, just dozens of them emerging from each branch tip in the spring. And this starts even on young plants. And the cone color can last, can last from four to eight weeks. So it has this very unique characteristic. It has its low globose growth shape. Um, we don't really have a size. If I had to put this, I would probably put it in a, a dwarf. I don't think it's going to be very large, at least the one that I have is not putting on um, any growth. But this also was the 2016 conifer of the year. This is Rydal. I don't know a lot about this one. It's going to be um, a taller um, spruce. It's a bushy tree is how it was described. Bright red young foliage turning dark green later in the season and it was found on a witch's broom. Another little spruce, this is spring fire and I, I have to be honest as a as a conehead conifer um, geek, I'm really wanting this plant. I really, really want this plant. Um, irregular globose miniature selection of a Norway spruce with this tight, tight branching and dense foliage and it, it presents this, these colors in the spring, just stunning. Um, it flushes a fiery red, depending on the type of spring that we're um, having. And again, if it's a warm spring, it'll lose its color sooner than if it is a cooler spring. Um, I hope you can see the one um, on the uh, left is actually, I can't get my, okay. 
that is actually a witch's broom. If you look closely at that picture, you're seeing that this portion down here is actually the main, the main part of the plant. And this witch's broom on top is that congested, tight growth that, that we have, have termed a, a witch's broom. Here we have it um, in Gary, Gary and Tom's garden out in Iowa, just, just tucked right into those rocks. This is another one that you might have seen in the trade. This is uh, Acrocona. It's a Norway spruce. It's a regular upright form. It has its unusual habit. It pr produces its cones at the end of the new growth. Acro, A-C-R-O, meaning at the end. Um, when a plant does this, when it forms its cones at the end, it also means that the plant is gonna be, stay somewhat uh, self-pruning in that the twigs stop growing when the cone forms. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that's a good characteristic. This one, the spring growth generally is going to be that limey green that you see on the right. But then as the summer progresses and the cones are starting to mature, you can see that the foliage has gone out to a more of a blue uh, coloration. Uh, it is going to be large. It can get tall after 10 years, 12 to 15 feet, but irregularly shaped. This is AB's push. Now this is a miniature and it's a kind of a miniature of what we just saw, the Acrocona. This was found on a witch's broom of um, Acrocona, the one we just saw. And it produces these multiple red cones every spring and then the bright green growth and after a bit, you can see here, all of those terminal uh, cones are starting to brown up. So this is going to keep its size smaller. And there's just a close up of the cones. And this one um, was a 2008 collector of the year. I just wanna go briefly into what I call the transitionals. Transitionals are uh, the conifers that are going to change colors, especially as we get into the colder temperatures. So here it's a cryptomeria, and this is a Japanese cedar, tends to do better in the southern part of the state, but I just wanted to show you, it, it changes color throughout the year, making it very unique in the landscape. So you see it green in the summer, but then people might think it's actually dying, but no, it's not. It goes into this plummy bronze color. Um, Monrovia Nursery gave me permission to uh, use these pictures. They're coming out with a whole series of transitional conifers. Here you're seeing Jazzy Jewel, which is an Andorra juniper, so it's going to stay low. And in the summer, it has these um, color variations of greens and golds. But then when the colder temperatures come around, now you're going to get golds and plum colors. So you know, you're getting two completely different looks of this plant with, with the seasonal change. Um, and being an Andorra, it's going to, you know, stay, stay fairly low, 18 to 20 inches and, and get wide. This is a Western Arborvitae, they're calling it Ember Waves. It's going to be an upright pyramidal. Uh, during the summer season, it's gonna have kind of a limey foliage, but in the fall, takes on these, these really rich, um, deep gold, orange, russet colorations. Now this is the transitional that a lot of conifer people uh, want to have in their garden. This is Chief Joseph. This is the first transitional that, that we purchased. Um, Contorta variety latifolia, it doesn't look like much in the summer. Uh, in fact, the one on the left is in, is, that's the one that's in my garden. Um, it's just coming out of its winter color. It's just starting to put on its new growth. Come midsummer, it's just going to be a plain green. But there you see it, the next, the winter will be on the left where it really pops with that yellow. And here, just, just a really interesting plant. That's the one that you saw in the picture of my backyard that was off to the right. It's just a brilliant lemon yellow. Slow growing. The largest one I've ever seen is about six feet tall. 
This is um, an arborvitae. There you can see it. It's going to be yellow green during the summertime and then it changes over to a bronze copper in the fall. And again, this was a collector of the year. There's a mugo that's come out. Uh, it's called Winter Sun. Um, sometimes you'll see it in the trade just Winter Sun, S-U-N. It's supposed to be an upright globo selection of mugo pine and the needles when they get into late fall into winter take on a beautiful yellow coloration and then in the summer it'll just green back up. This one is a microbiota de cruzada. This is Russian cypress. Russian cypress really came on the trade about 10 years ago because it's an evergreen ground cover for shady spots. It's um, going to stay low. It's softer than your coarse junipers and it turns a brilliant plum purple uh, in the winter. Now the one that you see on the right, that's grafted. That's grafted up a about, that's in my garden, I want to say about 24 inches. So it's coming down more as a cascade. So I just showed you that picture to give you an idea of the color change. We have variegation. Variegation is a catch-all term for any plants that have a variety of colors. This is a dragon's eye pine and you can see the banding. It gets its name dragon's eye because of that picture on the right, when you look directly down into its terminal uh, bud, it has the same effect supposedly as looking into a dragon's eye. Uh, large, um, easily 10 years, 10, 12 feet tall. And this little guy is uh, oriental spruce called silver seedling. A stunning white frosting on the upper surface of the branch and because it has both green and white in the needles it's able to photosynthesize. It still should not be put in the spot where it's going to get hot hot afternoon sun. Uh, intermediate so at about 10 years they say that it's probably going to yeah be about four or five feet tall. Now I want to get into just some final attributes and some things that you might not consider when you look at pines, but this is your lace bark pine. This is Pinus bungiana. This is a mature specimen, um, but this is what it does. The bark comes off, starts to peel in these kind of dark green, light green, bronze patches. It, it, it makes you think of a, a sycamore tree, a London plane tree, and it just no two are going to be the same here. This is a um, clump uh, Pinus pungiana, but it's going to get large, but the bark is just stunning. So beyond the, the foliage color, some of them have beautiful bark. And the last thing I wanted to talk about were the cones. There are beautiful cones. I'm just showing you here an assortment. Maybe you've never even realized the different types of uh, cones that evergreens can put out. Um, you're seeing a hemlock, you're seeing a um, Douglas fir, that's the Pseudotsuga, then all the rest are the abies, the firs, and I showed you many different types today. Here, what you're seeing on uh, big tuna, those are the pollen cones, that's what the, the male pollen is coming out. Uh, so that can be quite attractive. The one in the middle is a uh, fritch. Uh, it's starting to form its cone, that beautiful magenta purple. And the one on the far right was just some more pollen cones. I, I took that picture at an ACS meeting. Um, I'm not sure what exactly the plant is. I just thought the colors were beautiful. Here, just to get you thinking about cones, um, that's a Douglas fir, the Pseudotsuga menzitsii. Those cones, just pendulous, two-toned. They kind of have those spiny uh, appendages coming off. And the one on the other side, the Bracketica, this one I wish we could grow. Um, those of you in Southern Illinois and going into Kentucky would be able to grow this. Uh, it's a bristle cone. I just, I think that is just, just beautiful. 
So here, this is just some of the Abies cones, the pictures I've taken over the years. This was on one of our tours. I'm not exactly sure what type of Abies this was. It was just beautiful. Here, you're seeing the Cedar of Lebanon cones. That's uh, that Cedrus, unfortunately, Central Illinois and South, you can grow that. But look at the purple, the deep purple blue cones on that Abies uh, on, the, on the right. So, you know, beyond the foliage color, think about the cones. Also, I like the remnants of cones as they start to shatter. That can also be um, an attraction in the landscape. And finally, I just want to talk briefly about fall color. Yes, some conifers aren't evergreen. They drop their needles. Some of them can have beautiful fall colors. This is a larch and it's haverback. This is in my garden. Turns a beautiful gold color. In fact, I've had uh, gardeners call thinking that their larch is dying when it's really not. It's just going to go through its beautiful color transformation and drop its needles. Now this is a pseudo larix. This is a um, false larch and or if they call it the golden larch and this is what it looks like during the season but then come fall this is what you have. This I did some research on this and they said this could go up to zone four. Most books will list this as zone six or seven. If I were to grow it here in central to northern Illinois, I would probably want to keep it in a container. Um, just wouldn't want it to get to some size. It's difficult to propagate, so that's why it might be difficult to find. Bald cypress, it's another conifer that's not evergreen. It's going to drop its foliage. Uh, during the summer it has that soft green feathery texture to it, but come fall it takes on that beautiful russet red. Um, you can see it's growing right up against the water. In fact, it can grow in very wet soils. Oftentimes it'll produce its knees that come up out of the water. Now when we talk about fall color of conifers, this is not fall color. This is inner needle drop. This is on a white pine. This happens in the fall, but it happens on the inner needles. And this is normal. The plant no longer needs those inner needles. It's no longer the primary photosynthesizer for the plant. So plants will shed them. And people that aren't aware of this get concern because they think their plants are dying. No, if you look all around, pines do this. Um, arborvitaes can turn a russet uh, brown in the center. Um, it's not fall color, that's just inner needle drop. So that's my contact information. Um, and I know that there might be some questions. I'm just going to say view the past recordings of the Four Seasons Gardening YouTube site. And uh, are there any questions? Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, so I put in the chat link for, I put in the chat box the link for the survey. So please mm -hmm. take that survey. You did get a bunch of questions while you were talking, Martha. Thank you for your presentation. I learned so much about so many different kinds of conifers. There's so many different varieties out there. It's really, there's a lot of beautiful ones. <laughs> yes, there are. Um, so the first question is from R. Warner and they're asking if there's any significance to the asterisks on the size chart. Was that on one of your handouts? Um, that's, that is the very first. That is, um, if you go to the um, American Conifer website, um, they're going to say there was a, there is one asterisk next to size, and they they throw a little um, you know protecting statement there saying size may vary due to cultural, climatic, and geographical region. So that's what that asterisk. And on the other one, um, the same thing. It just refers to growth in any direction. 